Oh, yes, we can start. Uh, anybody have any anything they'd like to bring up, or shall I just go away? I was going to talk about some of the little points I missed, like uh, I wanted to go back to King Solomon, and uh, we know in the Bible that he put a yoke on the people, but I thought one of the most interesting stories of King Solomon that said that as he got older, he grew mad in the love of women and that his lust knew no bounds. He had ten, he had a thousand wives, according to the Bible, and... Uh, no wonder he was mad. Boy, I, <laughs> I, I'd always wondered how he made the rounds. I don't know. <laughs> a thousand of them. <laughs> well, of course, you know, maybe that's what killed him. I don't know. <laughs> but, uh huh. I don't know. Yeah, I uh, love, I oh. Right. Uh, anyway, you you wonder what was going on. You also wonder if the records are accurate. I mean, you know, sometimes those things over the years get kind of blown out. Of, the numbers get a little larger than normal. You know, I think ten live ten wise would have been quite a quite a challenge. <laughs> Not a thousand. <laughs> but it, it's interesting too that it seems that maybe. Maybe he had a bad opinion of women because if you read the, uh, uh, the uh, what, go to the Song of Solomon or in, in there, some of his writings, uh, he, he talked about, uh, he said, who can find a virtuous woman for her price is above rubies? Well, I didn't say much for women, is it? <laughs> no, I, I thought that, I, I picked that out. It, it, in his sayings. That's in Proverbs. Hmm? That's Proverbs. That's Proverbs, yeah. Okay, you're, you're right on that one. Yeah, I, I knew it was one of those. Yeah, And I, I, guess, it's, I guess it's his writing, but who... who um, so those of you who've got virtuous women in your life, I guess you're pretty lucky. Uh, and it just gives me the impression that, that you know, the guy was nuts anyway, <laughs> you know, because he, anybody had that many wives has got their head examined. But... Um, and it said that you, you remember in the New Testament, uh, Jesus he referred to Solomon in all of his glory. You know, and of course, I guess that maybe that meant his harems and everything else. And the Bible also says during that period uh, that Solomon put a yoke upon upon the you know the people. And then he dies, and they, his son Rehoboam is supposed to be the successor. And so he meets with the elders of Israel, and they're a little bit concerned about the about the problem they had with the old man and his taxes. And so they they counsel him. The old the older men counsel him to speak you know good words to the people as to what his policies are going to be. And so he he says, well, I'll I'll think about it for three days, and then I'll let you know. So at the end of three days, they want to know what what he had decided, and he said, well. In so many words, my, my father used to collect taxes with whips, but I'm going to collect them with scorpions, which is a, a barb-type whip that rips of flesh. Well, that didn't go over very big. They, they'd had enough of him, so they uh, proceeded to uh, say that he'll never be a king over them and that he can have the temple that his father built, and, and that's okay, but we don't want you around here. And then he tries to calm the situation by bringing out Solomon's chief tax collector. And that was a bad move because they stoned him to death. <laughs> They'd had enough of that guy too. So, uh, so the kingdom then splits. And, and I, I thought that was an interesting well, story. Well, yeah. Were well, Solomon's like concubines? A lot of those were more or less a form of tribute. Well, yeah, he, it did say that he felt that he brought in lots of foreign women, and and the problem with that Which was, was the way of, the well, way of well, they 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 bought in their idolatry. You see, that was the problem with the foreign women. Women it, it is the corruption of the religion. They were they were worshippers of idols and so forth in that period of time. I, I think it's been a long time since I've read it, but I think what caused the great taxation under him was. He spent so much money trying. Part of it was trying to build temples. For oh yeah. Many of his wives. Uh -huh. yeah. How old was he when he died? I don't know. Maybe forty. I don't know. 
With, with that many wives, would have killed anybody. I, I don't, you know, a lot of things we don't know. We, you know, we don't have a lot of facts on, on some of the details, but uh, uh, he was something, I tell you. And uh, uh, it's just that he grew mad with his love of women. But but he did have a tremendous tax system, obviously, and it was a tremendous <coughs> yoke on the people. And when they counseled his son to to to, you know, to not pursue that the way his old man did. Uh, he was going to hang in there and be as tough or tougher than his dad was. And scorpions didn't go over very big with the people. So anyway, he, he fled, and then the kingdom split, and because that was the end of him. Um, and, and kind of a sad ending. It, 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 I don't know if any of you ever been to Salt Lake City and seen the Lion House. Well, the Lion House is the building where Brigham Young had all his wives. So these these these, 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 these little apartments, you know, one right after the other, going down the line, and and, uh, and I, I, he had fifty, I guess, or fifty-two, and and that was that was quite yeah, a. But a lot of those were charity cases. If a mm-hmm. senior member died, mm-hmm. Brigham Young took in their wives to provide for it. Well, he did have a lot of kids. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he he had what fifty some children. I remember. So he was a he was a busy guy. And, and just a cute little story on that. In my family, my my great grandfather and great grandmother came across the plains of Salt Lake City in around 1865, I guess. And uh, my great grandfather was a very successful businessman in Salt Lake City, and and they made him a bishop of the local one of the local churches. And so then they decided, and this I got from my grandmother, they decided that it would be nice if he had another wife. And so the brethren went to my great grandmother and put pressure on her to consent to another wife, and she put her foot down and dug in her heels and there was no way that she was going to have her husband Tom Catton around Salt Lake City looking for <laughs> free felines <laughs> whatever you want to call it. and she was very bitter uh, according to my grandmother she never uh, never attended church after that she never put her kids in the church or the boys on missions she just she was very bitter about it and, and of course she saved him a lot of trouble because it wasn't too long after that that the Federal government moved in and arrested all those guys and charged them with unlawful habitation, and they were they were sent to prison for a while. So, uh, I guess my my great grandfather should have been kind of grateful that she was a stubborn one that she was. So, anyway, that was the story. And, and of course, now we we have some interesting accounts of uh, of polygamy up in Utah, which is quite. And they're finally starting to come up with some specials on television about them. I, I got one the other day. I recorded it for my for my daughter, and uh, it uh, just on that light, uh, the, the the church uh, abolished polygamy theoretically in in 1890, but uh, a splinter group broke off called the fundamentalists. We like the word fundamentalist. Look what it does in the world. Look at the Arabs and so forth. But anyway, and they still practice polygamy, and they say there's as many as 80,000 of them in the state of Utah that had multiple wives. So. But anyway, then I, I thought a little bit about uh, Nebuchadnezzar. I, I mentioned in my little outline, I, I said, you know, that, that good guy Nebuchadnezzar, the one who who went in and, and, and breached the walls of um, Jerusalem and took the people off into captivity. But what had happened is that uh, the Babylonians defeated the Assyrians and took over the what we'll call the eastern part of the Middle East at that time. And and they of course made their pitch into the area and they they came up to Jerusalem and and they they wanted tribute and and the Jews agreed to pay tribute and uh, so they thought that was just fine. And that's the way that's the way international politics worked in those days. They they didn't bring in uh, controls politically. They didn't bring in new leaders. All they did is wanted you to bring in the tribute once a year, usually. And then that's all. If you bring in the tribute, you can run your own show. But these are the numbers. <laughs> this is what you pay. Well, it seemed that the Jews did it for a while, and, and it said that they that they bought their peace with money, and, and then they had enough of that, and so they rebelled and stopped paying the taxes. 
Well, Nebuchadnezzar was really unhappy at that during the event, so he came back with his big battalions, and they 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 surrounded Jerusalem and uh, the Jews and sued for peace because they knew they couldn't win. And Nebuchadnezzar said, "Well, I'm going to put my own man in charge." So a fellow named Zedekiah was his hand-picked ruler over the Jews, and so Zedekiah said, yeah, I'll be a good boy, I'll collect the taxes, and so he did for a short season, and uh, then and he said, this is no good, so he stopped collecting the taxes, and I guess Nebuchadnezzar just blew his top, because even his, home, his own hand-picked man couldn't be trusted, so that's when he came down on Jerusalem and, and breached the walls and, and took the Jews into Babylonian captivity. Um, Babylon was a pretty advanced place at the time and I think the Jews probably enjoyed it there from what we can tell they probably had a pretty good time there and then then I uh, then the last king that followed uh, named Sarah, Cyrus I guess was his name uh, he must have realized that, that here he had these potential taxpayers there you know living living in Babylon, so maybe I'll send them back to where they belong, and then I can start collecting some money out of them. I think, I think the Jews look upon it as kind of a divine uh, a movement, but I think it was probably more just, just a tax game than anything else. Well, that's uh, an interesting story that uh, I just think is worth I, I like the stories of taxation that make the subject interesting. Um, when we went up to the Greeks, there was a few people who asked me asked some questions on the Greeks, and I, and I guess the one point that I missed is that among the wisdom of the Greeks, and, and they were a wise bunch, they looked around the world in which they lived, and, had, and, and they, they decided that civilization and tyranny were, went together. And why was it that... Uh, a tyranny prevailed among all the civilized societies like the Egyptians and the Hittites and the Persians and the Assyrians. And they concluded that the cause was direct taxation. And direct taxation was what brought about the tyranny in, in this particular region. And, and that was a truism. So that if you were to have a free society or a free civilization, the first thing you had to do was get rid of direct taxation. Now, Direct taxation it, it was taxes directly on the land or, or on the production and so forth, and that's why the, that's why the Greeks backed off yeah, and and liked to focus on tax on commerce. And uh, direct taxation, of course, is with us today. Uh, nobody seems to have been too concerned about it, except the founders of America. Um, the the um, Constitution uh, talks about direct taxation. And, it, and if you read the notes, there was a, there was a uh, question asked during the Constitutional Convention, what is a direct tax? And if, unfortunately, nobody answered it. But the direct tax is a term that the British had used for years to, to define income tax. And so when, they, when you read old British writing, they talk about direct tax, they're talking about income tax. So it is a tax on the individual. Indirect tax is a tax that is not on the individual. It's usually on a sale, like a sales tax, or it's on an import duty or things like that. Those are indirect taxes. But when they tax a person directly, that's a direct tax, or his land directly. For a poll tax thus, is, thus is, is the obvious and most common example of a direct tax. So it's a tax on the individual or his property? Yeah, a land tax, considered a direct tax. See, and that was the problem in the famous uh, income tax case when it came, went to the United States Supreme Court back in 1894. Um, was the income tax a direct tax? And uh, the majority of the court said, a tax on the income of real property is the same thing as a tax on real property. Therefore, it's a direct tax. Therefore, the Constitution has to be uh, allocated uh, proportionately among the states and population. And that was the that was that was the rule in the Constitution that they they felt that it had to be applied that way. And and so they held it was unconstitutional, and they did it because it was a direct tax, and that's the way they reasoned. 
Um, now, I want to talk a little bit about the come up to date. Well, well, actually, yeah, let's, let's stay with the direct tax because it kind of goes in. Uh, if the Greeks believed that direct taxation was a destructive of liberty, and that was pretty much what their theme was, and, and not a bad theme. I was going to say, you know, the, the Greeks were pretty wise. I, I think we've seen the great destruction of our liberty today because of the income tax, which is, because this is kind of a direct tax. But during England's time, right, right after Cromwell, or I can be getting with Cromwell, the, uh, the, the English or the British introduced the excise tax. And the excise tax was also sort of like the Greeks were. They felt that you couldn't have excise taxation and have liberty. It is a very destructive tax on liberty. They, they, they came up with that same conclusion. Um, the, uh, the, the, the excise tax, uh, there's some lovely illustrations in the big book that are showing an excise tax man, and he's this horrible looking guy. <laughs> Um, but they really hated the British hated the excise tax and they, and they fought it and and um, the, one of the reasons they fought it is because they felt that it was been very destructive tax it, uh, among the Dutch because see the Dutch took over after Spain collapsed and became the superpower of the day they couldn't maintain the the financial obligations of being a superpower they just they had to maintain wars and, and they had to protect the sea lanes, and, and, and the result was that they had increased taxes, and the more they increased taxes, the more trouble they got in. Yeah. How different is a sales tax from an excise tax? Pretty much the same thing. Same yeah. Tax, right? yeah, pretty much the same thing. It's a, it's, it's a type of an excise, if you want to call it that. Well, we have excise taxes occasionally. Sometimes we'll have them on jewelry, Telephone. uh, uh, telephones, uh, Bush uh, introduced... Yeah, cigarettes. Yeah, alcohol, yeah. Excises and and Bush introduced it, and he said no new taxes. But one of the taxes he introduced that it was was a tax on boats, and you remember that. And he ruined the boat. He, he ruined the boating industry. He then put an excise on automobiles that were over what thirty thousand or some yeah. number like that. Yeah, and and uh, and, and so excises are are, are these uh, that show up every time. The thing is on the continent. With the Dutch and the French and the Germans, the excise covered everything in sight. And the British were just kind of didn't like that, and they, they just didn't want a, a strong excise. But the first prime minister, so the word goes, of, of England was Sir Robert Walpole. And, and he's considered the first prime minister. Now, why was he the first prime minister? What, what was peculiar about him that made him a prime minister? you have any idea? Well, he was the first lord of the treasury. So he was a tax man. He was chancellor of the checker and first lord of the treasury. And that became the prime minister because the king needed money. And obviously the minister in charge of taxes was uh, the one who uh, would uh, become prime minister. And, and that probably continued to some degree down to the present time. Uh, but the... Uh, the excise was uh, was just hated by the British, and, they, and the people used to travel around with placards <coughs> and cards in their hair that said, liberty, property, and no excise, or liberty, property, and no wooden shoes, <laughs> meaning the Dutch, of course. So... Uh, they uh, they fought it, uh, and and the funny thing is, it, it was it was a tough tax because if you became an excise tax collector, you were you were a targeted man. And they made a study, and they found that in the case of a few years, there were I think 260 assaults on excise tax collectors, and there were six of them were murdered. And in one place, they broke in this guy's house, and they and they dragged him out of bed, and they murdered him in front of his family. So. It was it was a it was not a popular tax. The, the the British had a long struggle for a good tax. They they struggled with excises, but eventually Walpole had to back off and cancel them. He uh, he, he finally realized that there were revolts going, and 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 he 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 said to his staff, he says, well, the dance will go no further. I'm not going to collect taxes with blood in England. 
So that's when the excise ended. They had some other taxes during this period that were interesting. They had the uh, the chimney tax, which was the number of hearths that were in a house. And uh, I liked uh, the, uh, there was a little rhyme that went along with that. And let's see if I can find it here. Ah, oh, here it is. I guess this was a ballad. There is not one old dame in ten and search the nation through, but if you talk of chimney men, we'll spare them a curse or two. Now, the chimney men were private people, but they had to go through the house in order to count the chimneys and the hearths because apparently one chimney could carry more than one hearth. And so... Those were the chimney men. Well, the, well, the English, English women didn't like that at all. And so they got rid of the chimney tax. You know what they replaced it with? Window tax. Huh? Window tax. Right. With a window and door tax. And then you can just count the windows from the outside street, you see. So that turned out to be a solution to the, the problem with the, with the chimney tax. Anyway, I, I, I think that that particular epic in, in British history was interesting because it came to America. And the Americans hated the excise, and so when the whiskey tax was introduced with the Alexander Hamilton's tax, uh, the big argument was that this was an excise, and it was. It was an excise on whiskey, and, and it, it brought up all those hatreds of, of European taxes that aroused the Americans to go out and tar and feather all those uh, whiskey tax collectors. So the, so the ex, excise taxes finally died in that sense. Today we don't seem to care about it, but it was hated with a passion. Yeah. The same thing, the, the hatred for the excise tax seems mainly that the authorities focused on one item, uh, one one item, and people were met, uh, angry that what well, you're taxing are this or that versus a sales tax which would cover broadly. Yeah, yeah. That, that's what angered him, you think? Well, they, they just hated the excise. I, I think it was irrational. I don't think it had a lot of basis in it. But you see, they can look over to the continent and see Netherlands, and Netherlands was in terrible shape because of the excise tax, and France was in terrible shape. And so uh, there, were, there was a really a hatred for it. And the way it came about, um, Walpole particularly, it was a way to curb smuggling. Because all the coves around England, you know, and they were smuggling wine and tobacco and you know, everything was being smuggled in and, and, and avoiding customs. Yes. So they said, okay, uh, we'll solve that problem. We won't have a tax on customs. We'll have an excise tax, and that we can enforce and that we can control. And and they made quite a study of it. I, I, I think they, they found that... Uh, I'm just trying to think. I think they found there was four million pounds of tea that was uh, consumed by the English people, and there was only about six hundred thousand that was paid. So you went through customs, and so they then they decided, well, that's the solution. We'll, we'll just have an excise tax, and then then we can really control it. And I guess I guess it worked pretty well. Um, but we don't have that today to speak of. Uh, it, it, it's funny how uh, at one age what, what, what a, a tax would be so intolerable and so hated. Right now, you know, we hate the income tax, and uh, I've been we've hated it for a long time. So I, I don't know. It'll be interesting to see if they ever get rid of it. There was a, there were a number of groups about ten years ago on abolishing the um, income tax and and adopting a sales tax. A national sales tax, and you still hear some noises on it. And I, I've got an interesting letter in my file from Bill Archer, who, who was chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee, inviting me to come to the committee and, and talk about getting rid of the income tax. And so I had a great time down there, and, and it was fun. And, and uh, but that would kill that. There was a lot of great, interesting testimony there that came. I wasn't the only one is that Bill Clinton sent one of his flunkies down and they said he liked the tax the way it is, so that was the end of that. But that was an interesting contrast because Jimmy Carter had written back when he was president, he thought the income tax was a disgrace to the human race. 
And here's the Democratic president. So you got two Democratic presidents, one likes it and the other one says it's terrible. But of course, uh, because of the veto power on the American system of government, it was just a waste of time. And I think Bill Archer went to Clinton and had a powwow with him and decided it was a waste of time. So they didn't pursue it. They didn't draw legislation. What do you think of the value added tax? Pardon? What do you think of the value added tax? That? Um, well, it's interesting. We have it in Canada. It's got a goods and services tax. It's the same idea. Um, it's It's clever. <laughs> Uh, it's clever because the tax is assessed along the manufacturing process, um, and, and it is a kind of a, of a of an excise sales tax. It's in that same field. Yeah. Now, the, the Europeans have it. In fact, it, it, in order to get involved in the in the EU, you have to have a VAT. It, it's mandatory. Now you can have your own style, but uh, they require it. So it's a it's a, the, the, see, the, the, the continent in England is always like excises. They have a long history of that kind of taxation. So the value-added tax is, is just a more modern, sophisticated form of taxation. I, I, don't, uh, I don't have any, any thing. Of, uh, my problem was that if you're going to have it, then you ought to get rid of the income tax. But don't put it on top of the income tax. And, I, and, and that's what really happened in Canada. Brian Maroney, who was so called conservative prime minister, introduced the VAT, you want to call it that, on top of the income tax. And, of course, the government just loved it. I mean, now they really had a marvelous source of revenue. And, and that's, um, uh, he was thrown out of office with a tremendous uh, vote against him. And, and the liberals, who, who one said that they would get rid of the value-added tax, and of course they had no such intention. <laughs> so once they got in, and then it, it died. It was just a political pitch. Uh, I don't know if this is the appropriate time or you want to wait till Friday. I'd love for you to expand upon what do you think would be more ideal mm -hmm. if we could implement it? What should we get rid of currently? The US. What ifs, regardless of how practical, yeah. so uh, sometime, either today or Friday. Well, I, yeah, I, I, I tell you, a tax, a tax is, most any tax is okay if the rates are okay. And that's, that's it. If you have moderate rates, people will pay anything. Okay, fine, we'll pay it. You know, you got a 3% sales tax, 2% sales tax, people will pay it. You got a 3% income tax, people will pay it. So it's the rates of the tax, to me, I think, that is what, where the problem lies. Now, when I lived in the Cayman Islands years ago, we had a poll tax. Well, the only tax on the island was a poll tax. All males had to pay, well, it was peanuts. Nobody cared, but what if we'd had to pay $1,000 a piece, you know, then it wouldn't have gone over very well because, you know, a lot of the fishermen never poor and, and things like that. But I think I think it was 10 bucks a year, <laughs> 20 bucks a year, so I didn't mind paying it. That brings up, uh, you got to fight on the spending side. Yeah. To, that demands the tax. That's right. That's the problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah you, you can't, you, you can't. You can spend yourself to death, but you know, then what are you going to do? Well, you can, you can print money and you can do all kinds of things if, to cover your the deficits. So, either <laughs> a, a, but aside from a, a reasonable rate, we're burdened with this obscene code, you know, yeah. 10 feet high. I mean, versus a, a reasonable flat tax for yeah. the sales. Tax. Yeah. Yeah. You could get rid of all those regulations. That's an additional oh, benefit. Oh, yeah, it, it, yeah. Beyond, beyond the, the, the complexity of the income tax today is mind-boggling. That's the obscene. Yeah. In, in fact, there isn't any man, in my opinion, who could become an expert on the Internal Revenue Code. The whole code. Yes. On the whole code. Nobody could do it. Uh, it, it's just beyond uh, beyond comprehension. In fact, the flat tax uh, is an interesting tax. It, it, it was uh, uh, one of the main proponents of the guy named Rabushka, 
at, at Stanford University, and, and, and he wrote the uh, um, the book, The Flat Tax, and, and I had mentioned it in that book. I had an interesting experience with him. I was When I was writing for Good and Evil, I was doing some work on, on Israel and on their tax policies today, and uh, he had written a few things. I had really written 22 books at that time, and so I called up the Hoover Institute at Stanford and wanted to know if I might talk to him. I kind of like to know a little bit about what, what what his latest is on Israel, and modern Israel. And so they gave me his phone number, and I called him. And this is one of those <laughs> great bits of encouragement you have sometimes in your life. So I started to say, I gave you my name, and, and, and I said, I'm trying to find out. You've been writing these annual reports on the financial policies and taxes of Israel. And I says, I stopped here, but I'm trying to get the next one. I'm, I can't seem to find in the library. So he then said, are you the Adams that wrote the textbook? <laughs> and I said, yeah. He said, and that's that one. He said, that's the finest book on taxes ever written in the English language. Boy, did I nail him for the preface in the new one. <laughs> <laughs> But, but the thing is, that, I, I, that was such a shot in the arm because I had become so discouraged with this book because it was just difficult to sell it, you know. I, I, and so I was just, I, I was feeling pretty bad about it, although I was now moving ahead with the new one, and, and that really amazed me because one of the great fisc- tax scholars in the world would say that and it's fun and we became good friends after that we talked on the phone we spoke in the other certain places and he's a very bright guy I'm telling you he really is and, and he can spell that flat tax out in the most impressive ways uh, but um, I, I, I guess when you when you battled in this field for all those years you, you get kind of discouraged you know yes uh, I've read that the uh, the Russian tax system that they've implemented in the last few years will be modeled Pardon? The Russian tax system, and they've implemented the last couple of three years. Yeah, percent flat tax. A model yeah. system. Yeah, that's, I read about that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What's your opinion on that? Or was he involved in that? Flat tax? He could have been. He could have been. He, he's international and, and very famous in it. He could have been. In fact, I remember reading about that, and I was wondering if that was his baby, yeah. be, because it uh, it was a wonderful opportunity to see how it would work. Uh, I, I, uh, the Russians collecting a lot more revenue than yeah. they were before. Yeah. Yeah. People are willing to pay 13 percent, not 50. No, it, 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 people. It, it, it's the old uh, Chinese story. Mm-hmm. You bring the rates down, and and people pay the tax. In fact, one of the theories of the tax in ancient Greece was to keep the rates low, so the evasion wasn't worth the trouble. That's a good expression. If your rates are low, evasion isn't worth the trouble because you can live with it. Yeah, and, and, and we uh, we don't seem to have people believe that way. I think the Democrats, you know, soak the rich, soak the rich, and all that nonsense and so forth. They, uh, the rich paying too much as it is. Everybody's paying too much in that sense, but there isn't much we can do about it. It's really on the expenditure side, and I think that's where the big problem with the income tax is the expenditure. With any tax, I mean, even if we had a VAT or even if we had any tax, whatever it is, if the rates are too high, the tax stinks, and people will rebel, and people won't pay it, and people will find ways to get around it. Go ahead. Well, in, in Houston, we've uh, this Clap Texas group that I mentioned. Yeah. We we uh, uh, got twenty thousand signatures to, to change the city charter to. Uh, uh, Limit the amount of money they can tax and in turn spend mm-hmm. to an index of inflation and population growth, a combination of those two. So that might have to up to three percent. Mm-hmm. Normally, they'd want to go up five to ten percent every year, and it's going to be on the ballot in November. So we're fighting to get that implemented. And I think maybe cop some other states or cities have that in place already. Yeah. It's kind of, it, it, it limits the... Well, we, we, have, we have more prospects for tax reform at the state level. You know, the states are doing stuff. You know, they really are. At least like Proposition 13 in California, and, and then that took off everywhere. And, and But the feds are 
it's too wrapped up in in um, politics. I guess you know when when you listen to these these guys, if, if these can, you know, are going to soak the rich and soak the rich, the rich pay most of the taxes anyway. So the problem is, yeah, and I get maybe head, but if you go back to the Constitutional Convention, it was very clear in the debates they wanted taxes to be uniform and equal. And they explained that that way no faction could get control and could overburden another faction. They like to use the word faction. If the rates were uniform and equal, there was no possibility of that problem. Yeah, then you couldn't have Congress reward their friends. Yeah, no, no. Rates had to be they, uniform. They would have yeah. some of their power taken away. Sure. And I think you can only do that either with a flat tax or a sales tax. Yeah. To get rid of all the loopholes. Well, that, yeah. that, well, you could have a, you could have an income tax. The original income tax that had a had a flat rate. You know, original 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 was two percent. So you just simply, you just got to simplify it and lower it. To yeah. Right. yeah. But uh, well, we'll see. Who knows? I uh, yeah. But what was the flat tax guy's expert name again? I... Oh, a uh, Rabushka. Uh, if you if you got my book for good and evil. He wrote the foreword, and so there he is. <laughs> and you'll see, you'll see him. I, I really nailed him when he when he when he bragged about that. But he had two copies of that book. He just loved it. And I said, "Well, that you know, that's the first real praise I I have received for 15 years almost in terms of that that study." Yeah, so it was a God. I, I just couldn't believe my word, my ears. I I didn't feel I was a failure, but I but I felt I was a failure. In the sense that uh, nobody seemed to appreciate it. Yeah. Might I suggest, uh, if you have some spare change or yeah. whatever spare copies that you're willing to part with, yeah. at every new convening of the, uh, is it the House and Ways and Means Committee? Yeah, yeah, Congress, yeah. You ought to send a copy to each of those members. Actually, they all were given a copy. Were. Yeah. They in fact, in fact, in, in fact, in <laughs> fact, the, the whole Congress was. Some fellow, when that book came out, donated a copy. Huh? It'd be 93, 94. He donated a copy of that to every member of Congress. The guy uh, from the West Coast someplace. I, I later on found out who he was. Uh, it, was a, it was a good idea. I mean, but they don't read it, of course. But it was a good idea. I thought it was pretty good. Another... Uh, thing I wanted to pick up going back is I kind of go over what we talked about and and see what holes I, I thought we left was many of you are probably familiar with the book on the on the Roman Empire the fall of the Roman Empire Edward Gibbon yeah I mean, besides the fact that it's a big six volume or whatever it is there's also some short versions you know abridgments as you call I, I really think that's worth reading Gibbons uh, talked about the fall of Rome, and, and he zeroes in on the tax system in a number of ways. He's, one of the things he says is instead of wondering about what caused the fall of Rome, we should wonder how it lasted so long. Mm-hmm. That's one of it. Another one of his, his, his things was to describe that he does say that, that at the time of Augustus, uh, what they call the Peace of Augustus, was the greatest period of peace and prosperity ever enjoyed by the human race. So Rome, you know, was quite miraculous at that time. Then when, it, when they get into the tax system later on, uh, you know, he had a wonderful command of English language. He said it developed into a perpetual struggle between the powers of oppression and the arts of fraud. Isn't that a wonderful... <laughs> and, of course, he's talking about the taxpayers on the fraud side and the government on the oppressed side. And, and, and so Gibbon is certainly worth, worth reading. He, he got some great stuff. The other one that he said, I think is probably the best one, when he talks about the collapse of Rome, he uses the analogy to cloth. And he says, the stupendic, the stu- stupendic fabric yield to the pressure of its own weight. In other words, the bureaucracy was so heavy that it caused the system to collapse. Um, so Gibbons worth reading, uh, and, and, and he, uh, I just remember, the perpetual struggle between the powers of oppression and the arts of fraud still applies, doesn't it, to some degree? 
Doesn't the Rod Internal Revenue Service? Yeah, sure. Yeah. You can say arts of fraud. The, the, the only difference is that it isn't just fraud. We have what we call tax lawyers, you know, and 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 what you call tax planning. You know, that, that's the, the tax planning is a substitute. Well, a lot of them use fraud, but go ahead. Uh, one issue of the free market had a little essay on the nature of bureaucracy mm -hmm. last year, and that explains the, the, just the natural insidiousness of what bureaucracies feed. Well, yeah, it th the thing is, uh, the word is stupendous, that word stupendous fabric yielded to its pressure of its own weight. It wasn't just in Rome, one of the places it shows up was in Spain. Remember I mentioned how the people tried to avoid the, the tax system? One of them was they fled to the New World, and the, and the other one was they became aristocrats. And the third one was they became civil servants. Well, from the writings in that time, we read that it said it would take 25 men uh, were doing what one man could have done. Cause, and literally, uh, that, that, that it, you find it in the book. So well, well, that, that's what's happening today. <coughs> oh, yeah, the, you know, the bureaucracies are, are really uh, right. so powerful. Sure. But, I, but as it says, the stupendic. Stupendous fabric will yield to the pressure of its own weight. Uh, also, during this period, I mentioned Boudicca and uh, her revolt, and I, I wanted to read you, it's on page 107, at least in the new book. Um, there are two quotes there, and, and I think that uh, they are the best statements about tax rebelliousness and tax compliance. The rebelliousness is what Boudicca says. But the Roman general, Cerealis, who put her down and destroyed her, and also one, one in Gaul, one in France, he gives a little speech as to why you shouldn't do this. And those two contrasts, so interesting, uh, uh, here, here's what Boudicca says, and uh, it says, it describes her, the Romans described her, they said she was very tall, appearing most terrifying, around her neck was a large golden necklace, she now grasped a spear and spoke as follows, and, and you'll see the picture that, that's in my book on that. And, and, and then she says, besides pasturing and tilling for them all our other possessions, do we not pay yearly tribute for our very bodies? How much better it would be to have been sold to masters once and for all than possession empty titles of freedom. To have to ransom ourselves every year, which we do, you pay your income tax, ransom every year, how much better it would have been to have been slain than to go about with a tax on our head. Now that's about it. She roused 200,000, you know, people. Then, after she's put down, and, and after the, uh, the this, this Roman general, Surrealis, he then gives this little speech to the people in France after he destroyed their rebellion. The tranquility of peoples cannot be had without armies, nor armies without pay, nor pay without taxes. There will be vices as long as there are men, but they will not be everlasting. And they are compensated by the interval of better times. Let the lessons of fortune, and I love that, the Romans, in fortune in both its forms, good and bad, warn you not to prefer rebelliousness and ruin to obedience and security. Pretty good comment, you know, about rebellion. Uh, you could apply that to a lot of rebellions, you know, over, over the time of history. I I like that because I, I think it kind of says it all, and I don't have an answer to it, but as I have mentioned, most rebellions fail, and we, we don't appreciate that. We, we seem to think because the American Revolution that they succeeded, but then the South rebelled, wanted to withdraw from the Union. That was a horrible thing for the South and the North. It was a disaster. It was a, it, w it was a, 
as I've said in my book, it was a disgrace to, to civilization because everybody in Europe had looked upon America as this new country where, where brotherhood and commerce and so forth uh, would, would prevail. And here they were tearing each other's throats and slaughtering each people, everybody like flies. So it, it, it turned out that we were kind of a disgrace to the world for having lived up to what they saw for us. The other thing I wanted to bring up, I mentioned the Swiss. And there's a, a 189. There it is here. This guy is, is on the Swiss um, National Council. See, they, their president is, is selected from this ruling body. He isn't elected. That's why nobody knows his name. But uh, he talks about banking secrecy here. And I, and I think this quotation, his name is Robke. Banking secrecy is a major component of the wall of discretion that must protect the individual with his privacy if liberty is to be defended with success against the dominance of the state. This and no less is what is at stake and the frightening thing is that it should be necessary to state it. And of course, now, you know, we don't have any of that stuff. You know, it's long gone. But I thought that was, a, that was worth, worth the price of admission, so to speak. <laughs> I wanted to then go and kind of catch up to where I, uh, I was last time. I want to talk a little bit about Henry VIII. And he had the name of Bluff King Hal. you have any idea what that meant? He, I mean, he was Bluff King Hal. It means that he was a kind of a... Sharpie. I thought that was an interesting name for him. Uh, he uh, he tried to collect taxes uh, without parliamentary consent, and then finally he repented and said he was sorry, and uh, he, he wouldn't do it again. Uh, and in the meantime, he, he calls in all of the shillings, and he melts them down and starts adulterating them with pot metal and copper and stuff like that. And, and pretty soon, of course, the, mer- the merchants knew what was going on. But uh, th- that was one of his ploys, and then he decided, and I know he, did, he, he, he wasn't such a religious guy, um, he made his breach with the Pope. He wanted an annulment. And the Pope said, forget it. Uh, and he said, okay, that's fine. I'll just <laughs> throw all you guys out and seize the Catholic Church in Britain. And, he, and they, were, they were big big properties. They had enormous estates and things, and he swiped them all. So that was, uh, I think, why they called him Bluff King Hal, <laughs> was because he wasn't bluffing on that thing. And, and, and so the result was he swiped all the church. Uh, there were some interesting problems. One of, uh, what are you going to do with the poor and things like that? Because the church took care of the poor, you know, and the sick and, and the widows and the orphans and so forth. And and either was no problem. We just have the, the local towns do it, and, and so the burden shifted over to the towns. And of course, the, the merchants love this because one of their great problems in commerce was that England didn't have any any precious metals, and so every month they were every so often they were shipping off the, the money to the Pope, and it was called Peter Pants and so forth. And so when they when they stopped that, the, the merchants were happy as well. So that was yes. Bring up a question I've always wondered about, uh, about the uh, church taxes. The oh. Church taxes. Build these cathedrals and stuff like that? You mean, you mean now? No, back in the. In the uh, uh, Did they. History, yeah, I would. I would oh, I, I would assume the churches were exempt from tax. Uh, part of the reason they still a lot are, of people came to America was to escape the church tax. You mean the churches were taxed? Is that it? Churches were taxing the people. Oh, the church. Oh, okay. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, okay. The, yeah. I, I was thinking of the government tax in the or, churches. Or, or was it donations by the town people? I, I think it was more than that. <laughs> 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 I don't know that. Uh, what's your? I don't, I, 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 I don't have much. On that, I, I know that uh, uh, churches uh, uh, need money, and, and they have a way of, uh, you know, uh, of putting pressure on the congregation to pay it. That's all I know, and that that's true today as as ever. But 
Because anyway, so so then we have our our, our dear friend and our, our, our lovely, wise and noble woman, um, Elizabeth shows up, and let's see. I love some of her some of the sayings she made. One of the sayings about Elizabeth was just the opposite of her father. The solvency of her government was the miracle of the age. When all the other kings in Europe were going broke, she wasn't. And nobody could quite figure out. Like it says, the miracle of her age is she was sovereign because she, she didn't burden the people with taxes. In fact, she definitely reduced them. Um, and, what, and, and she stayed out of Europe's wars. And what, what do you think of this? I don't have enough ladies in here to attack their brain. But uh, she reaped a great advantage from being a woman. She was not tempted by the idea of military glory. Now, does that transpose into testosterone? Is that, is that <laughs> she didn't have any of that. But anyway, you know, that, that was some of the wonderful things about her. And I, I meant to pass those along to you. Because but then she make the privateers yeah. her navy. Yeah. And also they were pirates against the Spaniards. Yeah, that, well, the, 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 Span the Spaniards yeah. called them pirates. And that she was a pirate. And uh, wasn't she? Well, I guess she was, but she was a good pirate, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, you didn't have to go to all that trouble to raise the money to build to ships. She could just send out uh, Sir Francis Drake and some of his boys, and they would they would just prey on Spanish shipping. And and yet the funny thing about her being a pirate, because some writers, uh, as I told you, I wrote this article in the uh, in the Washington Post, and they had a nice picture of her and so forth. And I got all these nasty letters from people that hated her, and one of them was she was a pirate. Because she preyed on Spanish shipping, you know, through Sir Francis Drake. Studies were made about the number of Spanish ships that were captured during this period, and the Dutch were number one, and the French Huguenots were number two, and she was number three. Well, if it was all right for the Dutch to do it and the Huguenots, to do it, what was so wrong with her doing it? It seemed to me that was the game was at the time. And, and, and so she was so clever that she could do these things without taxes. See? See, she didn't have to tax the people to build the ships. She just said, okay, fellas, go out there and do your stuff, and we'll, we'll divide up the spoils, which they did. So, so I think it is one, of the, one of the interesting comments about her was from her successor, James I. Now, James is the one who gave us the King James Version of the Bible. And I don't know of you that, that, that have a chance to deal with the Bible, but it is a beautiful piece of literature. You know, it is just so superb. And I read some of the revised versions and later versions and this versions, and, and, and you really lose all the beauty of the King James Version. Maybe they correct a few things, but they just use the, they lose the beauty of it. Well, James, believe it or not, his mother was Mary, Queen of Scots, and Elizabeth's government chopped off her head. Now, you would think that James would be a little pissed, wouldn't you? <laughs> well, he said that Elizabeth was the greatest monarch since Augustus. So for him to say that, to the, to the lady who was somewhat responsible for his mother's shortening, they shortened her a little bit. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it shows you just how remarkable she was. I, I, I just like to keep. And, and when she was old, Elizabeth said, This I count as my glory, the glory of my crown. I have ruled with your love. And, and, and the British did love her, and that's why they called her Good Queen Bess. But, but of course, her, her fiscal policies, as we mentioned, were remarkable because she... She saved the coinage. She she uh, restored the currency, and it said that that set the British commerce on the road to you know, dominate the world because they had this wonderful shilling that was pure silver. The same thing that that the Greeks had. They had a pure silver denarius uh, drachma, and and uh, they guarded it. Uh, 
um, uh, the way we should have guarded ours. You know, and now, now we we have bought metal and we're we're up in the Roman League. It's going to be interesting to see what's going to happen. Some there's some pretty smart guys. I think some of the people here are talking about going back to the gold standard, and uh, and uh, uh, that it can be done. And it, in that sense, then of course you you wouldn't have this inflation problem that. It's so easy for governments to do. They just have to restrain themselves. Well, let's see what else I got here for you. Oh, yeah, I want to talk a little bit about more about uh, Frederick the Great. Um, he, he, he set up an excise tax, um, and he had the army collected. So it was said that Berlin... Um, was that the tax system, I have the exact words that they used, it was not an army with a state, but it, was, it wasn't a state with an army, it was an army with a state, and, and the war office in Berlin was a tax office. So, was, this the, uh, was he the ruler who protected Luther, or was that another? No, that yeah, another? yeah. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't know about that. I, uh, the interesting thing about him is when Napoleon went to his tomb, and he gathered in with his generals, and he said, "Men, gentlemen, hats off. If he were alive, we would not be here." <laughs> Which says a lot about his military genius as a ruler. Uh, yeah. Anyway. Uh, that was that. Was, the, the one thing about him, I, I suppose, is you have to remember that, that as the George Washington of Germany, he was not very happy with the Jews, and it wasn't too hard for uh, Hitler to find a lot of support. In fact, the the, the, the dislike, the anti-Semitism in Europe is really deeply ingrained. Uh, it's really ingrained. My wife is a Russian. And uh, she grew up in the Soviet Union and then eventually came to Canada. And boy, is she anti-Semitic. And, and she is anti-Semitic. And, and she has reasons. Because as a little girl, she remembers in Russia the way the Jewish people were and, and some of the things that she witnessed. And, the one, and like, for example, if you know Russia during the old days, she's always standing in line. If you've ever been there, you're always in line. And the uh, the pregnant women were permitted to go to the front of the line, and the Jewish women would put pillows in their gut and 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 show that they were pregnant. And then later on, they were discovered. And then any time they'd come up there, they'd punch them to see if it was for real. But those little things to to a young girl in Russia, you know, uh, they made impression on her, and and so she. She's um, we have some. She has some Jewish friends, but boy, she's she's not a. Uh, she, she's a bit of a. But she, she's representative of the way that people feel over there, and 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 grew up with it. So, uh, Frederick the Great, uh, he, he even passed a law, making it so that Jewish people couldn't get married, because then they wouldn't have any children. At least that was a theory. So he, he took, he. Uh, he he made quite a quite a deal out of that. But, but why would he do that if he you're saying that he uh, uh, invited Jews and to come back to Germany to receive special tax privileges and favors? Yeah, uh, I, I guess he needed their services. But, but yet he didn't want them to reproduce. He didn't want to reproduce. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, the. Um, Let's see how that goes. They, they, he, he didn't want them to reproduce. That he, he tried to repopulate Germany yeah. by inviting Jews and French Huguenots. Where are you reading? Uh, page 212, uh, the third par- second paragraph, first couple of sentences. So that how can he... They 
the first sentence is the great elector tried to read Dr. Frank. Well, but the great elector was not Henry the, was not Frederick, Frederick was not Frederick. Frederick. I, I think, I think it was. No, no, Frederick William is not Frederick. Yeah, no, yeah. Of course, Frederick's from Frederick. So, so Frederick Wilhelm was it? Frederick William of Brandenburg. Yeah, he was, he, yeah, he was the. The, the the first great elector it was called the great elector but, but that wasn't that wasn't uh, yeah that was a different one yeah because because he was okay but it was it, well, I guess it was his son or his grandson his great grandson yeah see the great grandson of the great elector Frederick the Great injected the element of moderation person rule but he was the one that turned turned on the uh, turned on the Jews uh, the uh, uh, Anyway, there are a lot of persecutions both ways, whichever Christians and Jews both against each other, yeah. whichever one had the upper hand. But today we mostly hear about Christians persecuting the Jews and not the other way around. It didn't justify either way, but yeah. Was, and oftentimes the Christians, particularly in the latter years, had the upper hand more often. Well, you see, the, the Jews have been kicked out of their homeland, and of course they became a scattered people and, and, and a lost people. They filtered all through Europe, and, and they got the jobs that the Christians didn't want. Uh, bankers, managed money, things like that, and of course that was stupid because that's where, the, that's where the power is, you know. So we built the Jews up, and then they decided to steal it all on the grounds that they... Acquired their, their their money by sinful means, and so then they gave you perfect license to swipe all the Jewish wealth. Uh, yeah, well, yeah. Well, actually, the, the Arabs have that same just, problem. Just redefine it. Yeah. Well, well, that's one of the things that you saw here in my book in France, how they were able to uh, make loans by uh, avoiding usury. And it's clever the way they did it. Uh, you would you would transfer your property to somebody and then you'd <coughs> rent it back, and 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 that would be a, a form of, of 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 interest and so forth. So they 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 tried to cover it up, but it really was. So. Well, well sharing in the profits of the business venture when they loan money and yeah. got extra money back. Well. I want to talk a little. I guess I want to talk a little about Walpole's excise tax. We we we've touched on it a little bit, um, and, and how he abandoned it. And then then we had I think I have a chapter here called "The Parliament Searches for a Better Tax," and uh, and, and in it the the British never could find a, a good tax, but they had a good system because everybody participated in it. And what was very unique about the British system is the rich were not exempt from taxes throughout all of Europe. You know, the aristocracy, the rich, the, uh, even the clergy paid no tax. It was really the commoners that paid the tax. But under the British system, there wasn't that exemption of the rich. The, the landowners paid tax, but they protected themselves by real low assessments. Uh, and, and as you remember, that every, every landowner made his own assessment, and that was what Elizabeth came up with. They had... Um, the merchants paid taxes uh, on, on excises and on customs, but there was a tremendous amount of smuggling, so they were protected. They didn't get clobbered too much. Um, the housewives uh, did pretty good because of the window and door tax, which exempted the poor. So there was so so actually the, the system was was balanced pretty nicely, but uh, it, but it was full of a lot of uh, what we would say. Uh, I wouldn't say frauds, but but it, it was uh, there were little loopholes and <laughs> things that, that ran around, and not a bad idea. Something that we have. Uh, the the Dutch, you see, made their terrible decline because uh, while they were the superpower uh, of, of the world, uh, they taxed themselves into debt. And there's one little statement there. It's uh, one writer on the on the Dutch Republic said, "War men expense expense." Expense meant taxation, and taxation meant the strangling of trade. And, that, and we found that, that in, uh, in the Netherlands, the taxes were so high, it was just unbelievable. I, I like, I like this, this one comment where a, a, a British uh, uh, writes home, he's, uh, 
He's an economic agent. He's in The Hague. And he says, it is strange to see what readiness this people do consent to extraordinary taxes, be yet as great as they were during the war with Spain. I have reckoned that a man cannot eat a dish of meat in an inn, but that in one way or another he shall pay 19 excise taxes out of it. Boy, is this strange, but true. And then another one wrote in, he said, well, you know, in England, this would never happen. We'd have revolution after revolution. Um, uh, with the taxes that the Dutch paid. So, so, the, so the Dutch, you know, they paid their taxes and, and they ruined their country. Just that simple. Mm-hmm. And, and did that coincide with the, when the Dutch were the great maritime power? Did that uh, coincide with the, the rising taxation of their empire? Decline. Yeah. That? Yeah. There, 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 it is said that the tax is what destroyed the Dutch Empire. In fact, in my book, okay. on page 411, you'll you'll see a, a a picture of some sailing ships, which was a which was a placard that was nailed up around Amsterdam, calling for people to book passage to the New Amsterdam, and the title to it is Freedom, in Dutch. And, and, and it says that when you get to New Amsterdam, you won't have any taxes. And, and, and that's how the Dutch, you know, uh, uh, settled in New York and set that up. So it was a, the, it's kind of sad what, what happened to them. But, uh, uh, and the British were so far ahead of them. They weren't about to uh, uh, institute taxes like this. Let's see where that one thing is. Since you've gotten into the Dutch, um, on your book you talk about how the taxes increased so much, especially between 1610 and 1650. And, you know, that was the time when the pilgrims were li- living in Leiden. Right, Leiden. I always heard they left because they were being, uh, uh, it's almost too free to there. They're, they're, they're their morals were being enticed by the Dutch. So they left and first went to Plymouth and then on to the New World. But I wonder if some of that was due to taxes. It probably was. I don't know if you had any, when you were doing yeah. your research, if that was any part of it. That was well, the time uh, when the taxes were increased. It's kind of interesting. They well, left, right? Well, my, you know, more people came to the New World, to the new world than the Old World to, to escape uh, Europe's taxes. Yeah, that's what I wondered. Yeah, any you know, other reason? Maybe that explains yeah. the... Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, there's, there's uh, the, the, the Irish, I, I remember in, in my book there, there's an a Irishman that writes home from uh, Ireland, uh, uh, writes home from America to Ireland, and, and, he, and he said, boy, you guys got to come here. You know, he says, we don't have any tax men here. And he says, everything a man <laughs> makes is his own. So he was telling his family to pack their bags and, and come to America, uh, which uh, we, it was, of course, the land of, of no taxes, and that was the main motive to come here. When certainly with the with the Spanish, we know that was true. I think it was true with the English as well. Okay. Uh, just curious. Uh, I see you have some uh, indexes to Hitler. Uh, what what rate? Of, how much of a tax or taxes? Did Hitler impose to, to do what he did? Was it heavy? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he put a 25% Jewish atonement tax, he called it, on the Jewish businesses and to be paid now, <laughs> you know, one of those deals. And the result was they just confiscated the Jewish businesses. And what about on the, the German pockets? What kind of taxes? Oh, I don't know. They, they're probably... You know, just normal income tax that everybody else was paying. But no, he just went after the Jews, and, he, and actually it was a good a good way to destroy them. Yeah. Was with taxism. We had this Jewish atonement tax, and it, it, I guess it worked pretty good. Uh, I, uh, I I do mention some of these little interesting things that are controversial because I know we're not supposed to be anti-Semitic, but when you live in a world that is anti-Semitic, sometimes you have to bring it up and talk about it. I, um, I've, I've worked with Jewish people all my life, you know, because most tax lawyers are Jewish. I don't know if you know that or not, but certainly 
when I went to UCLA Law School, we graduated a class of 84, and 68 were Jewish. We only had a dozen Gentiles. That's UCLA. You know, that's a big university. So it's a, they like law, and, and they go into taxes, too. They're, a number of the big ones have come to me many years ago when I was an actor, and they wanted me to show them how it was done. <laughs> when I lived in the Cayman Islands, I had a couple of them show up. I didn't show them, no. <laughs> Trade secrets, I guess, at the time. Well, I did want to ask you this question. I say in my book, when I talk about rebellions, when the rebels won, the taxpayers lost. you have any idea what I meant by that? Well, I know you gave the examples of the Dutch uh, when they had to increase the taxes to pay when they were... Example them. number one was when they kicked out the Spanish and, yeah. and got rid of the uh, tenth penny. They had to turn around and introduce excises that were higher than the tenth penny. So the rebels won, but the taxpayers lost in Holland. Okay, try another one. Well, the American Revolution. American Revolution. Uh, yeah. Taxes were higher than sure, they were. Taxes. Absolutely. American Revolution is a perfect example. Americans raised hell and were all upset with a stamp act and, and tax on tea, which was peanuts. I don't know if you ever look at the numbers on that. Um, and then as soon as they get, 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 get rid of the British and they have to pay for government, then they have to increase taxes, and so the taxpayers lost again. Say? Marco yeah. raised the taxes in the Philippines. So? Well, they lost after they got their freedom. Oh. oh, I see what you mean, yeah. Yeah, but it is a pretty universal rule that taxpayers do uh, do lose in the long run. In, in other words, you put it like this. The, the Americans said taxation without representation is tyranny. Taxation with Representation is worse. <laughs> yes. Uh, in history, why were we so fascinated with the tax rate of 10 percent? Ah, boy, maybe it goes back to the biblical tithe. You know, it goes far back in, in beyond history because the biblical tithe, the 10 percent, became a pretty standard throughout the world. It was in it was in China. Uh, we know it was in Greece. The Summa um, seemed that it was uh, it was is with the Mongols, the Golden Horde. Seemed the ten percent, uh, the biblical tie set the standard for what tax should be. Probably not a bad idea, you know. I mean, the flat tax people are talking about ten percent, so uh, maybe we should think that the biblical tie isn't so bad after all. I, I think that. Uh, Yes. Are you going to go back? You mentioned uh, yesterday about the French Revolution. Are you going to cover any more of that, or are you? No, no. I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I'll get to it. What, what would more would you like? Just well, give me some I, interest. I guess after reading uh, your discussion on all that went on in, in France between 1750 and 1780, I'm just amazed there weren't more French that left and went to the New World. And there doesn't seem to be that many. And I, I just wondered, there, mm. were they in some way running <coughs> or leaving like they did with the, the British and the uh, Germans? Or what was the reason? Well, well, uh, well, a lot of them, of course, went to what we call Quebec, you know, and, and the French... Um, French North America covered all through the northern regions, you know, all through Buffalo. You know how the Buffalo got its name, Buffalo? Yeah. Not from Buffalo. There's no Buffalo there. There never were any Buffalo there. It comes from the fact that that was part of, of the New France at the time. And the French word was that uh, as the water comes down, you know, over the, over the Niagara Falls and then runs down into Lake Erie, it was called a beautiful flow. Buffalo, a beautiful flow of the water. So it was the water flowing down 
in the Lake Erie from which the word buffalo came. I, but I, I mentioned it only because that was part of New France. You see, New France was pretty big, and, and it, it extended all through that region out to, um, to the north. Of course, Louisiana was part of New France, so there were there were places they went to. So they were emigrating, but yeah. they came back. Yeah, yeah, oh, okay. yeah. Quick, quick. And of course, we still got them up there. You know, they, 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 if you ever go to Quebec, <coughs> make sure they know you're an American. <laughs> really, because if you go up there as just an anglophone, you know, you might be from uh, Toronto or someplace. Boy, they hate your guts. You know, I mean, they give you a bad time up there. I. I I, I found it much better off to go up as American, and they will treat you pretty good. <laughs> but, uh, that, that's probably true. They, they probably, of course, you got to remember too. The French had other colonies too, you know, uh, which uh, were in the West New Indies, World in the West Indies. Indies that's right, Martinique, and many of those. Yeah. So maybe they did immigrate a lot. Maybe it just hasn't been publicized. They were free to come here. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Algeria and all through there. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, they had their colonies. That's, that's true. But the tax system sure was bad. Well, but any, any, maybe we just have some some fun talk. What would you guys? <laughs> yes. Uh, in the event that there has to be a government, is there an alternative to taxation? Can there be like, is there something else that someone might be able to come up with? Well, when I came up here on Monday morning, the guys pinned me down up here and they said, "Well, you do believe in some taxes, but most of the people here don't believe in any." <laughs> Well, <laughs> well, you see, the Greeks were pretty good at it. They had the lethargy, or whatever they called it, in which they they went to the richest people in town and in the cities, and and they they would tell them, we need this, we need that, we need this, and then they would supply it, and they would actually struggle for the honor, and they would be honored for it. So-and-so bridge. Huh? So-and-so bridge. Pardon? A bridge. Yeah, yeah, a bridge. In one where they, they uh, uh, who, who is the writer that uh, the Greek the Greek play where the guy is um, talking about? Uh, no, let's see if I can find this. This is this is worth reading because it came to one of the Greek plays where the. Uh, oh, here it is. Yeah. Yeah, the Indians, yeah. Uh, on page 66, uh, there's Xenophon, the Greek writer, and a, a student of Socrates. He recalls a dialogue between Socrates and a rich citizen, in which Socrates reminds his wealthy friend, I notice the city is already laying heavy expenses on you for keeping horses, financing plays, gymnasiums, and important functions. And should war broke out, I know they will impose on you the cost of naval vessels, soldiers' pay, and contributions so great that you will find it hard to comply. So so that's the way the liturgy worked. And, and apparently they competed for the honor. And, and you know, in today, we, you know, we don't honor people who pay huge taxes, you know. We say, ah, <coughs> A couple years ago, I had the opportunity to visit Jamestown Colony for a day. And yeah. Had a nice program there, but they they instigated taxes right away to pay the city councilman, and, and mm -hmm. a lot of it was paid in tobacco. Yeah. Yeah. I, I thought yeah. that was a really interesting how quick they were mm -hmm. to. Well, everybody ought to pay up to serve on the city council. Well, you, you can, you know, you can get volunteer labor, which was very pro pro prominent in ancient Greece, but uh, it didn't last. You know, unfortunately, they they went they went in the tax system, and then they went in the tax farmers, and and see the way that the tax farmers destroyed 
Egypt at the time of the Rosetta Stone is that the tax farmers were the Greeks and they were really good at their job. And they went to the, the, Tala, the Ptolemaic kings and they says, well, look, we'll make a deal with you. We'll pay you in advance for the taxes, you know, like the harbor tax, let's say. And you get the money now. And we'll guarantee a certain amount and we'll bid on it and then we can collect it. Uh, no, 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 I'm sorry. It's not we can collect it. We will just oversee the collection. Your scribes will do the collecting, and we will just make sure that you get every dime you're entitled to. And, of course, with the muscle of the Greeks and, and with the surveillance that they provided, that's what set off the, the rebellion that started the Rosetta Stone. Because previously, they hadn't had this overseer, and it was the Greek overseer which was responsible for the Civil War that set off the, the Rosetta Stone time. So, that's in it, yeah. The left today in America, the left uh, in America would love to have a Greek system under coercion to sack the rich. Yeah. And they would love that. Of course, the rich would more voluntarily be coerced. That tax farming scheme actually sounds like something the Chicago school would propose. <laughs> 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 yeah. I think in addition to the rate of taxes, one of the things you echo again and again in your book is the best tax which is the least intrusion yeah. to go into your house which go into your business I hear that echoed in your book yeah. again and again and you talk again about the excise of, of a candle having to go in and see even the, the breaking candle yeah. you have to do it while yeah. the yeah. officer is there yeah. Yeah. Really. yeah that was interesting the the British um, the British uh, excise tax you know they 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 really were pretty ugly yeah I don't know how you collect a tax with the least intrusion I mean uh, maybe you suggested uh, a consumption tax but something that that where you don't have to document somebody's yeah. income I, I don't know how you do it I, I know in Canada uh, I'm, I'm sure it's not unusual that this uh, VAT tax the, the uh, Somebody comes to your house to do uh, work, and uh, they'll give you this price, and you say, well, um, if I pay in cash, uh, what would it be off the books? And it's considerably lower. Well, well that's, that's the way the system works. Yeah. I, I remember <laughs> I've had some things done at my place, and they all want cash. I well, remember. You're happy to get into them, too. Oh, and, and, and I remember once I had a, I, how old things is, I had a toilet break. I need a new toilet. I got the plumber out, and he brought in the toilet and so forth. And I got out my checkbook. <laughs> no, <laughs> no checkbook, cash. He says, I bought that for cash. <laughs> he bought the toilet for cash. And he says, I install it and so forth. He had to pay me in cash. And the government just added to that a little bit. So a few years ago, the government, I guess they sent everybody a letter um, they were quite concerned with the fact that people were hiring mechanics and artisans and, and so forth, you know, things like that, and not paying any, any any tax on it and dealing in cash. And they wanted the citizens to turn them in. That's a lot of nerve, but go ahead. Do you speak to the notion that maybe my notions are not on target, but progressive ta income tax versus uh, a, uh, proportionate uh, versus a uh, regressive versus a uh, uh, flat. Well, there's progressive and there's regressive, and then there's in the middle, which versus is a, say a flat tax. Flat tax, okay. Yeah. Progressive yeah. Okay. Tax. Is it the the holdover from in the left uh, Marxism, socialism, class envy, warfare that they claim to this progressive income tax? And the, the different notions of fairness that uh, the, the, the flat tax, 10% of a, of a million dollars of income, that's a heck of a lot of money. That's $100,000. Yeah. Uh, where progressive, they can, they want to hit, yeah. hit a, a higher percentage, 30, 40, 50, 100,000, yeah. two, three, four, five hundred thousand. Um, uh, of course, I, I'd like to have the latter, the, 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 the uh, Flat tax, where sure, you know, somebody making ten thousand dollars might pay a hundred dollars, but the, the wealthy person would pay 
100,000. Yeah. But, but it's hard to, to overcome this class warfare. Yeah, yeah. It, it was Marx's idea, you know, high progressive income tax. That was a Karl Marx said. That a Marxist? Yeah, Karl Marx wrote that in, in the Communist Manifesto. A high progressive income tax. Yeah. I think Marx is giving way too much credit. Uh, I think he'd be smarter to blame intellectuals like uh, Bertrand Russell and John Dewey. Marx was a very uh, analytical, very difficult to read sort of person. He didn't have a lot of popular influence when he actually wrote. People like Bertrand Russell had much, much more influence. Vastly wider. Well, they, yeah, they, 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 they talk about the ability to pay and if you applied that to other things, if you went down to buy a loaf of bread and, and uh, well, how rich are you? It's $100 for a loaf of bread. You have the ability to pay that. But that's not the... I'm yeah. not saying anything about it. I'm just yeah. saying who's getting the credit for everything and popularizing mm -hmm. those ideas. Well, you're right. It's been a very popular... Uh, uh, and the thing is, there's, there's, no, there's no controls on it. The, the, it just goes from government to government or from parliament to parliament and so forth, and they just jockey up the rates down and up and so forth. There's no controls. I think that's the tragic thing is that people want constitutional controls on the taxing power. They want to, they, they want to fix so that it's uniform and equal, and that, that's what it we've should gotten, be. We've gotten away from well, yeah, we've gotten away from it, and it is a socialist idea. He's quite right on that, and, and Marx was involved in it, but it isn't just Marx. Would, would it take a combination of a, of a more common-sense Supreme Court and a common-sense Congress, the two combined, to try to get put the pendulum back in that direction? Well, one of the one of the attorneys that argued the 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 income tax case, the first one, he said, once you say that the many can tax the few, it will be impossible to take a backward step. And that's essentially what the income tax was. It was the many the taxing the few because, what was it, 90% of the people were exempt from the first income tax? Because it was a 2% tax on all income over $4,000, and $4,000 in 1890 was a lot of, uh, buy a lot of tacos, you know. And, and now is it? Those 50% are exempt right now, and the other 25% of them are public service, so they're in favor of tax. Who said that? Pardon? Who said that? But well, once you say the many can tax the few. Pardon? The, the quote you just said. Oh, <coughs> that was a. I think lawyer's name was Guthrie, and, and he um, he was representing. Uh, he was he was challenging the income tax in 1894 case, um, which you're probably familiar with it, and uh, and and that was his thing. Once you say the many can tax the few, it's impossible to take a backward step, and you know that's true. That seems to be pretty obvious, and, uh, and and that that was the thing that Madison was concerned with when 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 the uh, the Constitutional Convention and he was considered the author of the Constitution, but he he wrote very hard that uh, um, that uh, once you decide that that the, that the, say again again that, that the many can tax the few, then they no way protect themselves in the democratic society. Because they have the votes, the many, the many have the votes, and the few don't, and so then then they can do anything they want to. But if you had a constitution that that, that said taxes had to be uniform throughout the United States, you wouldn't have that problem, right? That's what it says. I, I mean, I thought you'd laugh at that because the Constitution says taxes have to be uniform throughout the United States, and at the convention the, the, they use the word uniform and equal. And throughout the 19th century, everybody believed that, that they had to be the same right for everybody. But the 16th Amendment changed that. Yeah. Of course it did. Yeah, it changed that. If you, if you want to say that, uh, the 16th Amendment gave Congress the power to tax without apportionment because the Constitution said all direct taxes have to be apportioned among the states by population. So it didn't really deal with that issue. 
it dealt with the fact that it was a direct tax and as such it didn't have to be apportioned among the states by population. That was our real guts of it. I think it's a fascinating study, the income tax, and I'm going to talk about it probably on Friday. I thought when we come back at 2 o'clock, we talk about the Enlightenment. I think there's so much wisdom in that period and what was the Enlightenment and what was their attitude about taxes and government and so forth, and it's very revealing because the Enlightenment was the age in which our Constitution was adopted, and so you see the wisdom of those folks. And so that'll do it for now. And any of you guys have stuff you want to talk about, let me know. I'm always interested because you people have some good comments that I learned too. So, okay. Have fun. Have lunch. Thank you.